morning, everyone. And uh, if anyone has just slipped in, or you're new here, or you're watching online for the first time, my name is Jason. I'm a pastor here, and uh, it's great to be sharing with you the next part in our series that we've been doing, looking at the Gospel of John. We have so many pens in here, there's no space for my drink. All right, I'm going to move those out the way. Okay, we are good to go. Right, let me pray for us. Do you want to perhaps close your eyes, maybe put your hand on your heart? If you're watching online, you can get really comfortable and just allow yourself to be open. We really had a sense that that was significant and important for today, that we would allow ourselves to be open to the way that God would want to meet with us and speak to us, minister to us, and change us. As I've shared before, these are, these are times where God is able to transform the trajectory of our lives as we bring our hearts before him and he speaks to us. So Father, we thank you. God, may your grace be upon this moment. We pray that your power would be in your words, your words which are spirit and life for us. Shape our hearts and our thinking, God. Just where our, our attitudes and our perspectives need to change, God, we pray, change them. Lord, would you awaken us. Just I, I pray that there would be a fresh spiritual energy in us from having engaged with your promises. And something I've really had a sense for today, that God has spoken promises over people's lives. And you have believed them. And yet there have been, as we were just singing about, those kind of headwinds and challenges and obstacles. And it's so easy to lose heart and lose hope and lose faith. And God's word to us is be courageous, don't be afraid, but believe in him. Believe in him and believe in his promises. And God, we pray for grace today to believe in you and believe in your word. In Jesus' name I ask. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Okay, okay. Uh, so uh, for those that are new, we are in the Gospel of John. Uh, and uh, this has been our kind of key idea, finding faith signpost to Jesus. And we began by looking at John chapter 20, which is a, a strange place to begin when you're walking through the Gospels. Although you'll begin to see, I'll speak about this in a moment, that John's chronology um, is uh, different. And purposeful, though different from the other Gospels. And so it kind of seemed fitting that we started in a different place. But John 20 gave us the whole purpose for him writing it. And do you remember? It was that we might know and believe that Jesus is Messiah and that Jesus is the Son of God. And that by believing those things about him, that he's Messiah and that he's Son of God, we might come to have life in his name. This is the whole purpose for this book. And so we're going to look today at how those, those ideas are embryonic still in chapter 1. We're in the last part of, uh, of John chapter 1 today. If you have your Bibles, you could perhaps uh, get to that. But before we read it, I want to read to you, or actually, uh, more truthfully, I'm going to have my wife, Nikki, read for all of us to help me out from Genesis chapter 28. Because this is a passage in the Old Testament that undergirds everything that's going to happen that we read about in John. So we've really got to have these ideas and themes in our mind. Remember, John is drawing from the Old Testament all the time, particularly from the book of Genesis. And the themes and ideas are very significant to him. And in order for us to really grasp them, we need to have them in our hearts. And so thank you to Nikki, who's going to read for us. Genesis chapter 28 from verse 10. Jacob left Beersheba and went towards Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place, put it there at his head, and lay down in that place. And he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky, and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. 
I will give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. Look, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, What an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Um, I want you to think just for a moment, and then I'm going to give you a moment to chat to some of the people next to you. What it must have been like for Jacob to have had that experience, to have encountered God in that way. How might that have shaped his heart and his thinking? How do you think you would have felt if, if you'd had that same experience? Or if you could have that experience, how might that change you even today? And so just uh, take a moment, and you are all doing so well at this. It's been really great to see people engaging. How would you feel if you had an encounter with God like Jacob did? Just turn to the person next to you and share what you think. What, what might that do to you? How might you feel? If you don't know the person sitting next to you, introduce yourself. And uh, it's a great opportunity to do that. We'll just give this a few minutes. And I did not know it until he made himself known. But I was right here. God was right there. And yet I was completely essentially oblivious to it, and then suddenly I knew it. And what an awesome place this is. And he goes on to call this place Bethel, the house of God, the place of God's dwelling, the place of his presence. I, I also think how small you would maybe feel, and yet at the same time, God is speaking these personal promises over your life. And saying, I will be with you. I'm going to work on behalf of you. There's a plan that you are a part of. And I'm involving you in my plan for the world. And you have a place you fit into to something that your life is not just meaningless and wafting through time. But I, the creator, God, have a purpose for you. What an amazing experience for him to have had. Okay, so we're going to hold some of those emotions, yes? You're going to carry them with you uh, as we begin to read from John chapter 1. And look out for those ideas. Remember, Messiah, Son of God, and this that we've just read about now. So John chapter 1 from verse 40. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard John and followed him. Do you remember Ryan touched on this last week? John the Baptist pointed out, there's Jesus. He's the one I was talking about. That's the one that you need to follow. And the disciples begin to go and to follow Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, look what he says, we have found the Messiah, which translated is the Christ. And this again is helpful for us. Sometimes we read our English Bibles and remember they were written originally in other languages. And so the word Messiah and the word Christ, they are the same words just from two different languages. Messiah is the Hebrew and Christ is the Greek and they both mean anointed one. Yes? So we found the anointed one, the Christ, the Messiah. And he brought Simon to Jesus. When Jesus saw him, he said, You are Simon, son of John. You will be called Cephas, which means Peter. And it sounds like the word for rock. Now, um, I think perhaps it's helpful to note some of you who are studiously reading the Gospels on a regular basis. This might be a bit surprising. Because if you read the other Gospel accounts like Matthew... When does Jesus say this to Peter? Is it in the beginning of the gospel? 
It's quite a bit later on, isn't it? After, after Peter has this confession, you are, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of the living God. And Jesus says, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. So it's a bit strange that we're getting this right at the very beginning. Did anyone notice that or did I just cause a problem? Okay, one hand. Well, for that one person, <laughs> but for all of us, this is perhaps helpful. Within... The ancient Jewish culture, there was not the same approach to time as we have today. There was a different approach. I was trying to think of ways to describe this. And actually, the language even reflects this because language reflects our culture. So we are a culture that's a bit obsessed with time. And so our language is geared towards that. We have past tense and present tense and future tense. You can know if something happens in the past or the present or the future just by the way you use your language. And it's important. If you give an account of something, we want to know when did it happen? Did this happen before this or did this happen after that? Okay, it's important to us. For the Jewish people at this point in history and within, this lang in the, within their language, and even more particularly perhaps within ancient Greek, the time is much less of a deal. In fact, there aren't sort of the sense of time in the language at all. It's not temporal, it's more about aspect. It's what is the significance of what has just happened? And so for John, he writes really about what is important for him at any given moment in the story. So how many of you have seen an encyclopedia before? Okay, so what they do with an encyclopedia is they gather all the information on a particular topic and that gets put in alphabetical order, yes? Dum, 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 dum. It doesn't get put in the order that things happened in the world. That would be a different way of ordering everything. John is a little bit more like an encyclopedia and everything is gathered into these key areas of information. And it's communicated in that way. So we just got to put on a slightly different cultural hat as we come to the Gospel of John. Why is he telling us this information now? That is the key question, not when did this happen. Yeah. So when you read the Gospel of John, and in fact when you read the whole of the Old Testament, the question we ask is not when did it happen, but why did it happen, and why is this important? That will really help you as you read through the whole of the Bible. Okay, let's carry on. That was a little diversion. Uh, verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethesda, the home of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets, Jesus, the son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Verse 47. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming towards him and said about him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus responded to him, do you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. I just want to pause here again for a moment. And by the way, you can file away this phrase, greater things than this. That becomes a key phrase through the whole of the Gospel of John. But I want to just pause on Nathaniel. I think it's quite amazing to see how easily his heart runs towards faith in Jesus. Jesus is kind of shocked by it. It's almost like he's coming to speak assuming he's going to have to give a lot in order for Nathaniel to be able to believe. And he gives just a little, just a little, and it's enough for Nathaniel to be able to say, you are the son of God. 
You are the son of God. What is it about Nathanael that enables him to be able to do that? And I think the gospel of John is going to pick up that there are times when people struggle to believe. Any of you had a wrestle with faith? at some point in your life. We all have, haven't we? And so there are going to be different characters that we can really relate to in the Gospel of John. We're going to come to Thomas in time. But it is also really precious when we see people who just seem to have a capacity to be able to trust God. And maybe there have been times in your life where there's been a capacity just to be able to trust God. And this, I think, is actually something that can be cultivated. We can get better at quickly being able to trust God. And so at Nathaniel's heart, there's a purity of his heart. Remember what Jesus says about it. Here is a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. In other words, he has a truthful heart. And, and I was meditating on this. When, the, when God's character has been formed in us, it enables us to see his character in him. It's like the deposit of God's character in our own life is like a window through which we can see God for who he is. Do you remember Jesus' words? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the pure in heart, they will see God. Or it made me think of this psalm, Psalm 24. Who may ascend the mountain of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not appealed to what is false and who has not sworn deceitfully. There, there is something about the truthfulness of Nathaniel's heart that enables him to recognize the truth of Jesus' words. And, and isn't that, I, I just think that's really interesting. If you can cultivate a heart of truthfulness. Deception and lying is a big deal to the Lord. And we can all be deceptive at times. And we've probably all not told the truth. Anyone in here never told a lie? Okay. Um, And there is something about that that puts a veil over our hearts to be able to recognize the reality of who God is. And, and it's like there was a thin veil for Nathaniel. I think that's inspiring for us to kind of hunger for that. And then he goes on to say this, verse 51. Then he said, truly I tell you, Nathaniel, you believe because of one small prophetic word. Truly I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And we have this direct quote out of Genesis 28 that Nikki read for us just a moment ago. The heavens opened and the angels ascending and descending. It's meant to, for John is trying to, take us all the way back to Genesis 28 and this moment of revelation where Jacob has this experience of having heaven opened. God the Father is there speaking directly to him. And he is able to connect. with. There is no barrier. Heaven and earth have been bridged. And Jesus says, I am the bridge. I am the bridge so that you can connect with your father in heaven. And through me, you will see the angels ascending and descending. Um, I read a great commentary on this by Craig Keener. I'd like to just read you a few little excerpts from it because I thought it was good. And uh, hopefully you will think the same. And if you don't, what can you do? Uh, (laughs) Craig Keener uh, says this, Jesus addresses all the disciples present and through them, all disciples in general. This is, he's speaking, he's speaking to Nathaniel, but he's speaking to you and he's speaking to me. It says, he promises his followers that they will see The heavens opened. This is the language of revelation. Uh, Interestingly, this word opened, to see the heavens opened, it's in the perfect tense in Greek. Again, remember, it's not about time. It's about how big is the impact of this action. And the idea is when heaven is opened over your life, it will fully accomplish its purpose. Because when you meet with God, it will change you forever. Yeah? When you meet with God, it will change you forever. 
Jesus, he goes on to say, is the link between heaven and earth, the realms above and below, between God and humanity. He likewise promises that Nathaniel and his colleagues will see angels ascending and descending. Thus, he is not only the son of man who will come from heaven, but he is the mediator between heaven and earth. In short, Jesus is Jacob's ladder, the one who mediates between God in heaven and his servant Jacob on earth. Thus, the true Israelite Speaking of Nathaniel and speaking of every person who will put their faith and trust in Jesus. The true Israelite, that's all of us who believed in him, may receive the revelation of God as his ancestor did. As Jacob's ladder, he is Bethel, God's house, an image which is going to be explored much more fully where we see Jesus as the temple. Here's what I want to leave with you. Jesus promise is for everyone who will trust in him, we can all enter in. We can all enter in. You know what you reflected on? What might it be like if you had the same experience as Jacob? And what Jesus is promising is you can. What Jesus is promising is you can. You can meet with God in a way where you hear his voice over your life. You hear his personal promises to you that what is going on in the world where God is at work, there is a place where you fit and God has a plan for you and he will be with you to the very end of the age and he will teach you what it is to walk in relationship with him where you will know his presence. I think I've shared this before. If you were to come to my house, you wouldn't all fit, but you know, if you came one at a time, uh, <laughs> if you came to my house and walked in the door, you would probably have a high expectation that you're going to see me at some point in the day. Why is that? Because it's my house, and my house is where I live. And what Jesus is saying is, when you come to me, you come to the Father's house. And if you come in through me, you are going to be with him and meet with him. It's why Jesus can say later on to the rest of his disciples, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Because I am the bridge. I am the gate of heaven. What does he say later on in John's gospel? I am the gate. And my sheep know my voice. And they come in and they go out. And I am the one on whom they come in and out on. I am the connection. I'm the one that's able to connect you to God. That you do not live alone. That you would live with a sense of his presence. Rachel prayed uh, or shared earlier in the service that all of us would have a sense of his presence in this place. That is something that can be cultivated, that we can know it's, it's much more than coming to church on a Sunday and sitting in your seat. You know, I love coming to church, I, you know, obviously. Um, <laughs> even when I'm on holiday, I go to church. You know, b- to be with God's people and to be worshiping and to have God's word spoken over us. These are amazing things, but you know you can come and not enter in. You can sing songs and be standing close to the stairway and not have actually put your foot on it. You can be at home and reading your Bible every day as I would encourage you to do because it will transform and change your life, but you can read and never meet him. And you can sing and never hear him sing over your life. And Jesus is saying it doesn't have to be like that. It doesn't have to be like that because I have come to be the bridge between heaven and earth. And if we can come with an expectation to meet him, not just to do Christian things, but actually to meet God, then God can begin to come and do his work in you. And life is different. Just like you thought, how would my life be different if I had a meeting like Jacob had? The difference is, Jacob got to do it once. We get to do it every time we still our heart and we come before the Lord and we choose to trust in Jesus 
And we pray that the Holy Spirit would work in our minds and our hearts and in our bodies. That we would, as it says in the Psalms, experience his love in the morning. And know the voice of the Spirit as he guides us on his level path. And be awakened to the reality of his love. Yeah? What an amazing beginning to the Gospel of John. Now, if you are left feeling, but gosh, I don't know how I can begin to do that. Don't worry. There are many additional chapters. We are only in chapter one. This is meant to be wetting your appetite and causing a sense of longing in you. But I don't meet with God like that. You know, I want to meet with God like that. Keep coming every week. Keep coming every week. Keep opening your Bible every day. Keep praying and let's see where we get. Now, this is great. The time has not changed since I set it. It still says 11.40, and yet time has moved on. So I am going to pray. Perhaps I can invite the team to come up, and I can invite you to stand. <clears throat> I have a sense of the, the longing and also the godly frustration that Paul must have felt as he prayed for the Ephesians. You know, frustration is a great motivator for prayer. You can have a godly frustration. And he prays for them that they would be so impacted in their inner being by the power of God that they would be able to grasp the love of God that goes beyond human understanding. Paul knew, I cannot teach people into an experience of God. All I can do is give a signpost. Yeah? John knows the same thing. All he can do is give a signpost. All anyone can do as we stand up front, the worship leaders, as they lead the songs and the words are on the screen, they're all signposts. And yet the hunger and desire and heart is that we would follow those signposts and actually meet with God. Yeah? Actually meet with God. And so if you're here today and you want to follow that signpost and you want to say, I want to know God like Jacob knew God, like Nathaniel came to know God, then in a moment, as everyone closes their eyes, I want to invite you to raise your hands. Maybe even both hands. It's kind of a two-handed thing, isn't it? This kind of response to the Lord. And I will pray for you. For that journey. Let's close our eyes as we come before him. And yes, if you want to say, not to me, but to the Lord today, Jesus, I want on to that staircase. I want on to that staircase. I want to meet with God like Jacob met with God. I want to meet with you like you promised Nathaniel could meet with you. I, I, I want to see the angels ascending and descending. I want to know what it is to be in the presence of God. I, I want to know what it is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever and sense his presence with me. If, if that is a true longing in your heart, then I want to invite you just to raise your hand. And say yes to God. You're just saying yes to God. God, this is my desire. This is what I want. This is what I want. And Father, I pray for all the people who are here that have their hands stretched out to you. And their hearts raised up to you. To say they want to know you the way you want us to, to know you. God, I pray that you would work in their hearts. I pray that, Holy Spirit, you would come and minister to them, that you would soften their hearts to you and awaken their minds to you. And God, you, Jesus, you came and you said, repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God is at hand. Father, I pray for grace, as it says in Hebrews, to lay aside the sin and to lay aside the stuff that entangles us, the veils that are over our eyes, that we might see you. Blessed are those with a pure heart, for they will see God. Lord, we pray that you would purify our hearts, that you would forgive us of our sin, 
Wasn't it powerful earlier as we sang that, that hymn and, and that our sin is nailed to the cross? I could feel the room change as we sang those words, that our, that our sin is able to be nailed to the cross, that Jesus could take it for us, that our lives could be transformed. God, would you change us? God, would you purify us? God, would you do a work in our hearts? We pray, draw us to you. And Father, I, I pray you can put your hands down. I pray, I pray for those that didn't feel maybe the courage to raise their hands. Maybe didn't feel the longing right now. Maybe life is in a difficult space. Or just their hearts are not there with you in this time. Lord, I pray for all those that didn't raise their hands. Lord, you know what they're going through. You know the wrestles in their heart. Maybe you know the doubts. Maybe you know the questions. We were praying earlier and just reminded of how, how the Holy Spirit is so empathetic and aware of where we are. And he can awaken us even, even without us being aware that it's happening. Just the breath of God begins to come over our hearts and passion and desire and longing begins to change. And maybe deep down for, for some of you, your desire is that you would have the desire. Your desire is that you would have the desire. And so, Lord, I pray, awaken that desire. Awaken that longing and awaken that thirst. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.